Welcome to Apostate of Mind. It was once thought that the Genesis story of the Old Testament was the oldest origin story. But as it turns out, there was a lot of older stories that predated it that had some influence on it. So we've explored in other episodes, the Egyptian influence, the Canaanite influence, but today we're gonna be taking a deep dive onto the Mesopotamian influence on Genesis. And we are going to be exploring that with my co-host, atheist Bible scholar, Mark Peralta. Hey, Mark. Hey, how's it going, Anne? It's good to be here. Hello, everybody. Yes, it's our first episode after the move. I see you're in your beautiful new studio. Yeah, it's excited to be here. I've got all my books in one place. What, what else could I need? So. Exactly. <clears throat> uh, I know you have a whole section on your shelf just about some of these myths. Uh, So kick us off. The Bible was once thought to be the oldest origin story. So, so what changed? How did that uh, notion get challenged? Yeah. So over the last century or two, there have been several archeological digs that have found essentially ancient libraries in, in the region of Mesopotamia. For example, the library of Ashurbanipal, in the city of Nineveh, it's this modern day Iraq. There's uh, libraries that have been uncovered in Ugarit, Mari. So there's lots of places that now scholars have had access to clay tablets with cuneiform writings of these very ancient myths, most of which actually predate anything that's like Bible, like the book of Genesis, where you have stories that are just as fascinating, if not more, about like the myths about creation, even the flood accounts, a concept that's very similar to Adam and Eve, like the first man. Oh, wow. Yes. Now, before scholars were able to decipher exactly what these ancient cuneiform tablets are actually saying, let me show you this bit of history that I find very interesting. Now, this is a very large cuneiform inscription that's found on the side of a castle that was discovered in eastern Turkey. According to scholars, it comes from the Persian king Xerxes, which reigned during the 6th century BC. And what's really unique about this is that not only that it contains cuneiform writing, but it actually contains three versions of the same epic story ascribed to the god Ahura Mazda. And how this helped out scholars was that it was actually, you've got on the on the far left, it's in Old Persian. In the middle is the Babylonian language version. And then on the far right is an Elamite version. And so because there are three different writings of the same story using three different languages, but using cuneiform, inscriptions, scholars were able to like learn more about the languages and decipher exactly like what is old Persian versus Babylonian or Elamite and other dialects that are using cuneiform writing in the past to record their stories. Wow. So it's like a Rosetta stone for ancient literature. I think that's right. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like a Rosetta stone. Mm hmm. Cool. So they were able to now find these writings and decipher what they were saying. And now we get to compare them. So now these things have been translated into uh, languages that we can actually read and interpret. And so now it's like, all right, well, what's going on here? Uh, It seems like Genesis is is not all that uh, authentic or original. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a lot more going on that simply this all of a sudden... uh, divine inspiration as, as most, uh, Bible, uh, Christian ap- apologists would argue what have you believe. Yeah. And so speaking of Christian apologists, what would you make of the argument of, well, yeah, there's all these older stories that are similar because it's true. And these are just other cultures who had this, you know, knowledge of origin stories. What yeah, would you say for sure. So because of there being so many, say, flood myths that have surfaced from antiquity, um, apologists will try to say that, oh, well, there's your evidence that a global flood took place. 
But that's just not the case. The evidence shows that these are just local phenomena. Mesopotamia is essentially this patch of land. You can see this on the map. This is a uh, modern day Iraq. So it's in the Middle East. To the south is the Arabian Peninsula. And this is the green area that goes from the east, uh, the most eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea all the way to the Persian Gulf. And it has sort of like a U-shaped, upside down U-shaped. Uh, that's why it's known as a crescent. And fertile because it's it contains these massive rivers, massive river systems. You might have heard of the Tigris and the Euphrates. And so there's uh, lots of opportunity there for agriculture and very suitable for, for crops and for civilization to start. You know, Mesopotamia has been labeled uh, by scholars as the cradle of civilization because it, it's the most suitable area for civilizations to to start and thrive because of the the geography is it also a suitable area for flooding yeah so then the, what happens here is with these massive river systems is that most of the water is going to originate from the very north from like if you see up on the map the caucus mm. mountains so lots of water will then drain down these rivers. And then um, it's, a, it's an area where it's very likely for floods to take place, high tides to, um, to form because of these rivers, they, they change directions. There's a lot of activity with, with regards of all the water coming down from the mountains. And so that makes it more suitable for floods. In fact, geologists that have studied the region have concluded that many floods have taken place in these areas in the past, but not so much in the area of Palestine and Israel, where ancient Israelites lived. So, so this is a kind of different area than Israel or maybe where the biblical writers are coming from. So how does this area influence that area? Yeah, so like what happened, uh, what would often happen in antiquity is that um, commerce and trade would take place uh, sort of back and forth from the Persian Gulf to over to the Mediterranean, down south over onto the Egypt area. And so as merchants and commerce took place back and forth, because, uh, you know, you inevitably you need oil, you need spices, you need flour, you need raw materials. And so these products would be brought back and forth and along with them would also come um, stories and myths and legends as part mm -hmm. of like the culture. And so it's, it's just fascinating to see how like all these ideas developed and it's, it's primarily promoted by the travel uh, because of commerce. Gotcha. So what are some of the main ideas that the Mesopotamian culture passed along? The Mesopotamian culture starts off with the Sumerians that they start uh, writing things um, where you have creation myths that come out and sort of the um, idea of the gods given order to a chaotic primordial world is very much a Mesopotamian concept that I think gets uh, later developed by the authors of Genesis into what we have today. But overall, the concept of there being primordial waters and the gods sort of separating them, allowing land to surface up from the water and thus creation begins. So when we read some of these ancient myths like the Enuma Elish, and we understand how they perceived this creation to have taken place. A lot of these ideas, they transfer over onto Genesis. So much so that we even have like this flood. There are two flood accounts in Genesis that are very much, very similar to some of these myths as well. So you specifically mentioned the Enuma Elish as one of the myths or stories that had an influence on Genesis. Mm -hmm. And in fact, on World History Encyclopedia on worldhistory.org, there's commentary that says that the Enuma Elish would later be the inspiration for the Hebrew scribes who created the text now known as the biblical book of Genesis. And so talk to us what ways would you say that Enuma Elish had an influence on the book of Genesis? 
Yeah. So one clear example to me is uh, chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God mm. was hovering over the waters. So this for example, the, the Elish? no, this is Genesis one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that word deep, for example, is a word that is recognized to be sort of, uh, it's related to a similar word used in the Enuma Elish that, um, where the name Tiamat comes from, which also means deep. So you and, see the, the evidence of the God's name in the language. Yeah. And then also listen to this part here too. Verse six, it says, and God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so, and called the vault sky. That's a word firmament, which it's very similar to what's happening here. So if I'll read the Enuma Elish, uh, and verse one says, when the heavens above did not exist and earth beneath had not come into being, there was Apsu, the first in order, their begetter, and Demiurge, Tiamat. There's that word that it's also related to the word for deep in Hebrew, who gave birth to them all. They had mingled their waters together before meadowland had coalesced and reed bed was to be found. So there's that concept of primordial waters that are chaotic because they're combined together. And then later it says how the waters were also divided with the waters above to the waters below. So very similar mm -hmm. concept of a primordial chaotic universe that gets shaped into something by the God. And I want you to keep that in mind. The whole uh, separating of the waters becomes uh, very important in within the context of the flood that comes later. Okay. So it's things like that. Yeah. Um, and so when we talk about the older literature influencing the Genesis writings, what does influence mean or look like? How does that happen? Yeah. So there's a lot of misunderstanding about like what that really looks like. And it's certainly not a uh, plagiarism. It's not like the authors of Genesis sat down and they were like, well, how did God really create the world? Well, we don't know, but the Mesopotamians were talking about this. Why don't we just go ahead and grab that? I think that the ancient authors, this was common knowledge. Like this was the, how the world was understood to be. And maybe this will be a good time to share with you the cosmology, like how the ancient uh, Sumerians and Babylonians saw the world. And that's a tripartite earth or universe. Tripartite because it's three things. You've got the heavens above. That's the, the realm of the gods. Then you've got the land of the living where we are. And then the netherworld, the underworld, which is, you know, the realm of the dead. And it, not only that, but also the Babylonians were the first ones to suggest that there is a firmament or something solid that is holding water above the sky and that mm -hmm. there are gates. And whenever the gods want to bring rain down, they're just opening these gates. Very similar to what's happening in Genesis. You'll get a clear picture of these gates and how that's working in the narrative of the flood because it mentions how the gates were opened or there's a word in there, uh, the waterfalls. And so it's, they're looking at the world in the same way. And so I think that they're simply reframing it or recontextualizing uh, these ideas, these already accepted concepts of how the world is and how it might've come to be, to become. And they're saying, but it was our God who did it. And mm. by the way, our God is more powerful than yours. And so it's a retelling, but, you know, given a new context. Gotcha. Almost yeah. like a response to those other claims by those other gods. That's correct. Yeah. It's not like um, the humanity had no clue or had no idea of how the world came to be. And then all of a sudden, these ancient Israelites are 
getting, you know, inspiration from my dad. knowledge. Yeah, this is how it came to be. Uh Uh-huh. Really? So then you have to sort of wonder, so if there is a God and Genesis is the only inspired text, then is it that God uh, was using this already common knowledge and just simply giving it his own, like, okay, but this is the real story? Common knowledge that was then disproven later on once under scientific understanding came about. Yeah. And that's what we have to keep in mind as modern readers is that we know that the world is completely different than this. Not to mention that the, the ancient Sumerians and Babylonians, which they came later, they were the first ones to promote the idea that the earth is flat. And so this flat earth cosmology originates with them and then you know, ancient Israelites don't correct it. They, they, they continue presupposing that's how the world is. It's mm-hmm. just really interesting because it gives us sort of like a, a glimpse of how these people were thinking about how the world is, like how we would today consult an astronomy book or something. Yeah. So give us some more examples of evidence that the biblical writers were sort of borrowing from Mesopotamian mm-hmm. cultural ideas. Yeah. So in the ancient world, We're talking the late Bronze Age to the beginning of the Iron Age. Lots of literature starts surfacing. And the ancient Sumerians were actually pioneers in writing because they invented cuneiform, which enabled civilizations. And it was not just the Babylonians, but, you know, there were others that utilized cuneiform writing to uh, at first they're writing down things that relate to economy and commerce, uh, accounting, you know, how many goats, how many heads of goats you're traveling with if you're emergent, etc. Wait, and, so is cuneiform the oldest writings that we've found now? Yeah, I believe cuneiform is recognized as the, fir- the very first form of writing ah, that okay. was invented. Yeah. And it later then becomes kind of a script that other languages are using the same characters, but the sounds are different and the meaning is different. At this point in time, you've got the Egyptians from one end writing things down with the um, hieroglyphics. And at the same time, you've got the Mesopotamians writing things down with cuneiform. So... As writing is developing, people then eventually start writing things down. So, for example, the Sumerians are also recognized for being the one, the first ones to invent narrative literature, like telling a story from point A to, to Z. Mm. Yeah, prose. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, the stories, are they start um, spreading and they are the first ones also to uh, start a school system. So now the Sumerians are teaching pupils how to write and they're using the stories as templates to develop their writing. And so you've got gotcha. tons of copies of these myths that are spreading all over the place because they're part of the, the culture now, the writing culture. Give us some examples of how they polemicized or tacked the other societies or religions. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, one quick way would be since we have this common understanding of that, the fact that there was a flood that took place, you know, then Mm -hmm. it's in Genesis, it's essentially what's happening is that it's, it's Yahweh that, you know, he's the one responsible for the flood, not in Lil. Uh huh. You know, he's the one that can bring wrath um, that you need protection from who has that power. That's right. Yeah. It was not that Marduk split Tiamat in half and created, formed the firmament with half of her body. It is that Yahweh separated the waters and he, you know, he brought about that allowed land to come about and, you know, he did it through his spirit or something. Hmm. Another polemic that's clearly a polemic against you know, these writings or the, or the, the religious systems coming from Mesopotamia is the, the flood, you know? So the flood is, is part of like this genre of literature of divine judgment. 
And mm -hmm. uh, so if there's going to be divine judgment taking place, you know, it was Yahweh who did it. And this is how he did it. And this is why he did it. So in, in, uh -huh. in that case, in the Atrahasis, for example, which is another flood myth coming from this region, the main God um, brings down divine judgment because the humans are too noisy. They're, they're multiplying. They are, they're doing too many things. And they're working all the time and, and they're just really noisy. And the, the main God gets really upset and he hates the fact that there's all this noise. And it, or in order to cancel the noise, he decides to, he first plagues the earth and then sends them some other disease. And then he resolves to bring down a flood to kill everybody. But then, then there's other God that is sort of like paying attention and he decides to approach a human being that he thinks that he's worthy of being saved. And this is starting to sound, hopefully this, this is starting to sound like Noah. Sounds very familiar. And in the same, in a similar way, the God approaches Atrahasis and gives him instructions on how to build the ark. Oh, he, still has a, an ark too? Yeah, there's an ark. Yeah, exactly. So before Noah's Ark, there was the Ark built by the Atrahasis, uh, which also shows up. There's another version of that same myth in the uh, Tablet 11 of the Epic of Gilgamesh. The names are different, but it's the same concept. A god approaches man. He tells them to build an Ark. In the Mesopotamian tradition, the god is not supposed to do that. He's going way out of his way to, to reveal his information to Atrahasis. In Genesis is God that's taking compassion on this one man and his family. Mm. So it's not that a God uh, circumvented the main God or betrayed the primary God who ordered the flood, but it was that Yahweh himself had compassion on this man. Unlike the Mesopotamian tradition where the problem is the noise in Genesis mm. is more like people are bad. So I think Genesis is proposing a much more reasonable and moral reason as to why he flooded the earth. But but still, what? yes, like you can see the reason why they're retelling it just a little bit differently, but still the same mm -hmm. idea of you've displeased the gods and that's why these bad things are happening. <clears throat> that's right. Yeah. So it's, it's a reframing, it's a recontextualizing with the name Yahweh in place and with other influences as well, because it's not like direct borrowing. I think that it, it just, it grabs onto many things, kind of a snowball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can see what you're saying now. You have these stories that are already existing, people know about, and now they're writing these stories in response to those stories, but with now presenting their ideas. So what inspired them to the biblical writers to sit down and write these stories? So I think what might have jump started the whole thing is now we have to think about what's happening in the eighth century BC when the Assyrians in, uh, in 722 BC, they invade the Northern part Israel and take many people captive. But as you might imagine in the ancient, ancient world, just like today, when a country is being invaded, the people that have the money and the resources to get away, they're gonna do that. So it's understood by scholars that many rich, wealthy people, scribes, priests, people that had you know affluent people, they migrated down south, escaping the Assyrians. And when that happened, uh, it you know it, it it started a period of syncretism where now people are like well all right well so we need to preserve these these traditions these stories that are part of our uh, upbringing and so let's start writing things down because we don't know what's going to happen here mm. so then the south of Israel namely Judea which has a more a more prominent belief in the God Yahweh sort of absorbs a lot of this Northern traditions 
of like Elohim and the Canaanite religions, the stuff that came out of the Canaanites. And uh, these ideas get sort of brought together. And I think uh, that's when you have the first formations of like uh, a Pentateuch, for example, where uh, the, the na- people are uh, the scribes or the, you know, the, the scholars, the theologians are like f- for the first time deciding, all right, uh, there's all these writings. We, these are the ones that we really want to preserve. Or these are the writings that are most meaningful to us, namely the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, as they're understood. And so as history is developing, things are be, begin to be written down. Up until the aftermath of the exile, where now folks are coming back to sort of restart the cult of Yahweh, and they have a new beginning. So the Bible today is a product of that new beginning after the exile from coming back from Babylonia. That makes a lot of sense. So you gave us some examples of the Enuma Elish. You mentioned Gilgamesh, Mm -hmm. but I know you've mentioned other myths that have had influence on Genesis. What are some other examples? Yeah, uh, we'll finish this out with my favorite one, which is called Adapa and the South Wind. It's, It's yet another Sumerian Mesopotamian tradition where we get uh, sort of like an Adam and Eve story, but it's, it's just Adam. And it's essentially where the ancients are trying to answer the question, how did, how is it that man did not partake of immortality like the gods, which Mm -hmm. is a question that's part of the, the whole concept of Genesis three as well. And I think Um, it, it's one of those age old questions that we have as humans. Like why do some people die young and the gods are the ones who knows and decides no one else can make that decision. That's right. Yeah. This, that's known as an etiology, which is sort of um, in broad terms, uh, a story that explains how something came to be, mm-hmm. you know? So in this case, yeah. How is it that man is not immortal or why do people die? Mm-hmm. And so in the Adam and Eve story, you've got uh, disobedience and ultimately the God banishes Adam and Eve from the garden through which they could otherwise eat of the tree of life that would give them immortality or prolong their life. But in the, in the Adapa myth is bread and water, which is really interesting. Okay. And it's a bread and water that the main God, I think his name is Enlil, he offers it to Adapa as a, as a recompense for this tragedy that tragedy that happened to him. He was out fishing one day and then a big storm came about and capsized the ship and he nearly died. And so when Adapa, you know, goes back to the surface or the shore, he, he pronounces a curse and he curses the South wind which he, he, he attributes as the wind responsible for capsizing the boat. And when he does that, he literally stops the wind from happening. Like he just casted uh, a spell. The storm God takes wind of this, no pun intended. And he's like, wait a minute, this is not a good idea. What are you doing? So he brings him into question. And um, Adapa makes the case, like he was just upset that, you know, he nearly died and blah, blah, blah. And so the God takes pity on him and offers him bread and water. But before uh, Adapa had a chance to go up to heaven to speak to this God, another God approached him and it was like, Hey, you're going to get to talk to so-and-so. And I don't think it's a good idea. If they offer you bread and water, don't take it because it might kill you. Hmm, you will surely like a die. Warning, don't eat of this. Yeah, because if you eat of it, you will surely die. Huh. Okay. Almost verbatim. The warning from the serpent. So when it comes down to it, Adapa says, no, no, thank you. And there, and then the God, the main God uh, takes offense at this and sends him back to earth and basically, all right, well, continue being immortal. Good luck. And that's how Adapa and which who's representing humanity in this case, loses his opportunity at attaining immortality. 
Uh, he wow. rejects. Yeah. And, but as it turns out, there's something really interesting in the story is that it seems like the main God that had, uh, that offered the bread and this water, he actually, at the beginning, he might have had intentions of really killing him, but then he changed his mind and took pity on him and was actually going to give him immortality. So what you could conclude from that story is that the God, the other God who advised Adapa not to eat it because he will surely die was maybe lying? Was lying. Yeah. Yeah. Was he lying? But there's a reason why, because it's not a good idea for human beings to be immortal. Mm -hmm. You know, they're making the case that, you know, it's kind of good that people die because life is a lot of work, <laughs> you know? And so at some point we need rest. And, you know, yeah. so someone's getting banished from eating, uh, from having access to uh, uh, fruit. Someone's getting banished from, you know, uh, eating this bread and water or gets tricked to not eating it and loses his chance. And loses mortality yeah. and loses all these gifts given to them from the gods, the garden, being the masters of everything. An easy life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So similarly in the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's not that he gets tricked into, but he hesitates he, he finally finds the plant that would give him immortality and he lays down to rest and he's sort of like, I don't know if I should eat it. Maybe it doesn't work. And then all of a sudden a serpent comes out and eats it for him. What? That story has a serpent it too? It's a serpent. Yeah, as well. Oh my gosh. And as a serpent eats it, it I guess it, it, it shaves off or it loses his skin or it leaves the skin behind. Mm -hmm. And and Gilgamesh sees that as evidence that the plant did work. So making the, serpent, the, the mortality, leaving the mortality behind and making the snake immortal? Yeah. So you know how like uh, lizards will regrow their tails? Mm -hmm. I think Christians looked up on some of these reptiles as having multiple lives or the ability to continue living, unlike human beings where you lose an arm, that's it. So it's um it's 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 like they're they're all trying to respond or bring light to a dilemma. And these myths, these stories are their best versions of of how you know, these things came to be. So fascinating. I think we've always known that the biblical writers didn't write the Bible in a vacuum, but once you understand all the influences and understand the context, it really brings to light that these biblical stories were not original, were not superior or more correct than the others. And I think you kind of see how they interplay and in which case it becomes just like one of the other creation myths, not, not different, but one of many. Mm -hmm. uh, so Mark, thank you so much for taking us on a deep dive through this. Um, thank y'all for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And you have been watching Apostate, Apostate of, of Mind. mind.